I am the network co-lead for the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. Some of you are probably familiar with us. Some of you have just probably seen this on a channel and we're really excited that you are part of this wheel talk today. We have these on a monthly basis and we have um, thinkers, activists, change makers come together and explore and share transformative ideas around how we can change society and how we can work towards an economy and service of life. So we are all about social justice on a healthy planet and we have a variety of talks in this space and every single month we have different speakers that obviously come and share a topic and I think that's really important to us knowledge sharing if we want to co-create a future that is you know serves all of us we really need a plurality of perspectives as well so without further ado I am going to welcome you to today's we all talk um, it's our first one for 2024, and it is with none other than Professor Derek Hamilton. Derek is the Henry Cohen Professor of Economics and Urban Policy and the founding director of the Institute on Race, Power, and Political Economy at the New School. And his groundbreaking work challenges traditional economic thought, advocating for an inclusive approach to economic rights, which are inseparable from human rights. And so today he's going to be sharing with us for approximately 30 minutes, and we want your participation and your questions towards the end of this too. So please be thinking. There's a little button at the bottom that says Q&A. So pop those questions that you might have in the Q&A or even in the chat, and we'd love to facilitate that towards the end. So if you could all give a big wave and welcome to Derek, and I'll hand over to you, Derek. Thank you so much. Well, let me begin with gratitude uh, that, for that warm introduction and also gratitude to be a part of this network, this network that's grounded in scholarship, but not just knowledge for the sake of knowledge creation, but translating it into action and public engagement uh, to create a greater good. And, and with that, we need a North Star. We need a North Star conception of how you began this this seminar, uh, what is justice? Uh, I'm gonna take myself off the view of full screen and go back to gallery so I can. <laughs> Do you mind, Derek? <laughs> Look at yourself when you, sorry. It's because um, there's no, so many people, so I want them to be able to see. No, I'm glad you. it's, it's <laughs> uh, but, but for me, <laughs> The worst thing you can do is look at yourself when you're talking. <laughs> so uh, um, so with that self-awareness, I'll, I'll also get back to the point and say, uh, we, we need a North Star conception. It's not enough to have issues. It's problematic if we have issues without a North Star. Um, but likewise, it's problematic to not have a North, to have a North Star without some policies and some actions behind it. Uh, so I'm gonna, talk about a North Star of a human rights economy. Um, but in so doing, I'm gonna to try to be provocative and uh, bring up a book written by Professor Jared Ball called The Propaganda of the Black Buying Power Myth. So I'm gonna uh, take that on uh, in the context of, of what we're currently situated in um, and then talk about the political economic aspects of how that uh, a myth uh, that Jared empirically points out, uh, it, it can be problematic. But, you know, we don't just look at problems. We're going to have, I'm going to present what I think is a pathway towards justice, a pathway towards a, a better economy. All right. Okay. In determining how to define structures and direct public resources with the purpose of promoting economic and industrial activity, one should first and foremost begin with a simple but fundamental question. What is the purpose of an economy? And then the second follow-up question is, what is government's role in achieving that purpose? Without a North Star that details the purpose of an economy, we're limited in our ability to challenge our existing norms and reimagine something different and better. The emergent framework of my discipline of economics 
presented as a science is part of the problem. That presents an innuendo of a purity devoid of politics, devoid of power, and the tribalism that have constantly that we've constantly seen across space and time throughout human history. The concept of individual price takers at baseline does not adequately account for power and capital, especially if we're trying to explain identity group disparity. Moreover, markets themselves are political and social constructions and constructions that are influenced by the uneven distribution of both power and capital. That's especially true if we want to understand and explain group disparity both within and across nation states. Although unacknowledged by the economics profession, economic scholarship has always been influenced by both politics and societal power relationships. The iterative and inseparable intersections of social stratifications, whether we're talking about race, gender, caste, ethnicity, how they relate to economics and politics, it should be undeniable. It's naive to not recognize that essentially every policy and structure in the US has been racialized. And the impact of that racialization is by no means limited to black people. Ignorance of the past and existing racial hierarchy under the guise of a forward-looking race neutrality is basically what the sociologist Eduardo Bonilla Silver accurately describes as a colorblind racism. The structures of our political economy go well beyond class and individual bigotry. And as a matter of course, race and social identities in general, they are weaponized. They are strategically used to generate hierarchy and propel systems of poverty and stratification, as well as persistent inequality. The empirical reality, and I'm going to talk a lot about, about the, I'm going to start with the base of the United States, but I dare say this is certainly not unique to the United States and frankly is pervasive. The empirical reality is that race-based disparities persist and even widen with higher socioeconomic attainment. This empirical reality is vivid, vivid when it comes to things like the racial wealth gap, which has its genesis in slavery when black people were literally the capital of a white slave owning plantation class. Despite secular improvements with regards to uh, redressing inequality in education and income, when it comes to wealth, the racial wealth gap has largely remained unchanged since We've been recording such data on a systematic basis. The limited explanatory power of education, what we label human capital, and the extent of the racialized nature of Americans' political economy, it goes well beyond wealth. The unemployment rate for Black people is typically twice that of white workers, irrespective of age and irrespective edu in education. In terms of earning, Black workers are paid less than their white counterparts, irrespective of their social and economic characteristics. Moreover, across business cycle, racial disparities widen and widen more with those with higher levels of education, further emphasizing the role of social identity hierarchy in establishing distribution for socially desired outcomes. How that sorting becomes even more marginalized occurs when we're in the throes of a recession. It has generally been the case that black workers are the first fired when the economy begins to spiral down and the last hired when it begins to recover. In the context of the COVID pandemic, when unemployment suddenly spiked for everyone, we had this category that we characterized essential workers and black and Latinx workers were well overrepresented and those low wage customer and coworker contact oriented occupation when the pandemic health risks were their greatest. And this was true even after we accounted for educational attainment. Throughout human history, race and social identity more broadly have played profound roles in shaping outcomes within the United States and across the globe. Its absence as a focal point in any political economic analysis 
is gratuitous and myopic. All scholarship, all public policy, and all remedies begin with a normative set of values. This is not a general critique, but rather a simple statement of fact, a fact that opens the door for productive and critical engagement with any program, with any structure or policy. Any identification or framing of what is or is not a problem and any purported solution to said problem. There are few examples, now I'm gonna get into the example I described in the beginning, but there are few examples that reveal the powerful effect of these discourse framings and purported solutions more so than black buying power. And no one has dispelled this myth with clarity, purpose, and overwhelming empirics more so than Professor Jared Ball in his seminal text, The Myth and Propaganda of Black Buying Power. The myth is pervasive. Essentially, every U.S. president since Richard Nixon through Barack Obama has, has centered entrepreneurship as well as education, and we could talk a lot about education, as the cornerstone for pathways for Black economic development. The political and economic effect of Black buying power myth absolves the state for the conditions and remedy of racial economic disparity and Black economic underdevelopment. Instead, it shifts the locus and onus of this disparity onto Black people, in this case, Black buying power decision-making themselves. Whether this political discourse is intentional or not, it's counterproductive. The underlying politics of this self-help efficacy, especially if public resources are not being deployed, is that it is either deliberately intended to explain away racial stratification, or unconsciously overlooking the roles of race, racism, and material outcomes in determining material outcomes. The economics of it, it, of, of it, it black bound power is believed to be powered by a free market ethos where atomized rational economic actors transact with each other, guided by free will to generate so-called efficient, optimal, and colorblind social and economic outcomes. In this formulation, any attempt of the state to exert stimulus or regulatory influence on the economic arrangements and relationships for the intended outcomes is considered to be an interference, a distortion, a deviation from a natural order. That is to say the state cannot deliver what heroic individuals can, can accomplish for themselves when left to their own devices. The notion of black buying power extends this market fundamentalism of individual decision-making dogma to consumption choices and its intended racial uplift. If black people would only engage in more strategic spending habits, we would be able to gain a greater share of America's vast wealth. Nothing can be further from the truth. From the very beginnings of this American project, our government has proactively shaped our economy, determining who reaps the benefits of our prosperity. For example, while the 19th century import tariffs and infrastructure investments nurtured a fledging, fledgling, sorry, domestic industrial base, Fugitive slave lords enshrined the racial structure of both work and ownership. Currently, the U.S. government's genocidal displaced, uh, concurrently, sorry, didn't mean to say currently, concurrently, the U.S. government's genocidal displacement of indigenous people from their homelands made way for things like the Homestead Act, which transferred lands to white families free of any charge. Also, the same New Deal policies and investments that generated the conditions and capital to fuel white wealth in America, defrauded Black people of whatever capital they may have amassed, and redlined them into under-resourced and dilapidated neighborhoods. The proactive role that our government has played in determining both winners and losers, especially by race, is undeniable. 
There's no aspect of our economy that is beyond the purview of the continuous involvement of our government. We have an economic structure that from its origins was founded upon Black people as chattel capital. The racial wealth gap, income inequality, wage stagnation, and the persistence of poverty that characterizes the American economy, they are not natural, nor are they accidental. They are the direct and deliberate result of laws and policies, both past and present, designed to serve specific interests. There is no amount of individual economic effort that can outrun the centuries-long programs of resource hoarding among the wealthy and the powerful few supported by a political economy that offers the dominant political group, in the case of the U.S., that's predominantly white men with the exception of some women and some Black people. Relative status anchored by otherness by which we define Blackness. Why then is the myth of Black buying power so widespread and so enduring? Why does it still hold such resonance as a viable solution to longstanding racial stratification? The myth is appealing for so many audiences for different reasons. For those interested in preserving the economic status quo, the myth serves the function of misdirection. In focusing on individual choices of Black consumers, the myth lets government and the larger public off the hook. For Black people, as Professor Jared Bell keenly observes, the mythic efficacy of Black buying power has found its way into every corner of Black ideological spectrum, from Black conservatives to Black nationalists, the Black left, and everyone in between. The underlying commonality is that we are all drawn to the myth's promise of agency and self-efficacy. However, the inconvenient truth is that the efficacy of the Black buying power is limited to selling advertisement for Black-owned and Black-targeted media outlets. Beyond that, the value of the Black buying power, especially when inflicted as the general mandate to buy Black, it is largely an aesthetic. Now, I don't want to minimize that aesthetic. I am personally drawn to that aesthetic. Moreover, the feelings of affinity, the feelings of consciousness and solidarity delivers substantial psychological and cultural benefits. However, we should not be naive, we should not be naive to the limitations of consumption preferences in the context of a reality where we have inadequate economic assets, power and ownership of the means of production. Instead, we need an actual strategy to improve the material conditions for Black people. But all is not lost. If not collective buying power, where the actual remedy of efficacy can be found is with collective agency. Our agency lies not in a mythic notion of buying power, but in political power. Ultimately, our economy is a choice. We can determine and define value. There's no such thing as a free market. All markets, all economic relationships are political choices enforced by our government through discourse, through laws, and through policy. Exerting a claim on our economy requires that we build movements and organizations that exact demands and conditions that truly empower Black people and all people with the resources to be self-determining with economic agency. So going back to that simple but fundamental question in which I began, what is the purpose of an economy? And what is government's role in achieving that purpose? The purpose of an economy should be to promote our productive capacities, advance tranquility, and promote human flourishing. It should enable people to be self-determining in righteous ways. And the role of government should be to set the rules and steward public resources in order to achieve that purpose. Although not complete and certainly imperfect, we have a blueprint. 
75 years ago, an international coalition led by Eleanor Roosevelt, convened by the United Nations, issued the landmark Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Human rights were described to be universal and related to the maintenance of human dignity, and nation states had a responsibility a fiduciary to deliver on those rights. The declaration coming out of a political context of the atrocities of the Second World War and the economic destabilization that preceded that Second World War was meant to promote human flourishing and tranquility at a time when despair within and among nation states was ubiquitous. The UN Declaration of Human Rights identified five categories, civil rights, political rights, social rights, cultural rights, and economic rights. In isolation or in subset, those human rights are inadequate. In fact, in isolation or subsets, they are co-optations of our notion of rights and freedom. Realized or not, civil and political aspects of human rights, they're, re they're well ingrained in our public psyche. However, at least important is economic rights. The right to assembly, the right to speech, the right to choice in general is limited if an individual lacks a basic need like a job, adequate income, shelter, food, or health care. Over time, economic rights are the one category that seems to have lost its momentum. But the Marshall Plan and the policies from the New Deal and the Great Society demonstrate what realizing the amb ambitious set out by the Declaration of, of, of Human Rights, what it could look like, especially as it relates to making investments both in people and places. We need industrial policy that centers people and our environment. I love the indigenous concept of the environment to humanize the environment, not in a charitable sense, but in a productive sense. That's why those investments should take place. Our best foreign policy is investment. It promotes tranquility. It promotes migration stabilization. Starting in the 1970s, what we had instead was a neoliberal revolution and a narrowing of the understanding of what human rights should be and that narrowing was in the realms of political and civil rights. Again, however inadequate we are in achieving it, and also the rights pertaining to the protection of property. property. Industrial policy began to focus on firms in a zero-sum, winner-take-all, state competition in international spheres. This type of industrial policy is antithetical to shared human flourishing and leaves us vulnerable to the economic context of fear, despair, and growing inequality both within and across nation state. The very situation that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights sought to address in the first place. A 21st century iteration of economic rights would learn from the failures of exclusion from the past by emphasizing that we design, implement, and manage economic rights in an intentionally inclusive way of all social identity groups, an affirmative inclusion, as well as all nation states, particularly those that are most marginalized. The rhetorical illusion and elegance around words like freedom and choice and a specific notion of rights, not the economic rights of people, but the economic rights of property is a rhetoric devoid of an honest reckoning with the immoral practices by which property has come to be distributed in the first place. Without resources, individuals are largely restricted from benefiting from economic markets and instead are at the whim or charity or exploitation of agents or nations in those markets that have resources. To be clear, our political economy has come to naturalize poverty and inequality by castigating it as the result of unproductive and deficient behavior. That is, subpar outcomes are seen as resulting from personal choices of individuals and communities. 
An inclusive economic rights frame turns all of this on its head by locating poverty and inequality as resulting from an absence of resources. That is, poverty and inequalities are the result of policy choices that deny people the resources they need to live meaningful lives. There's a baseline set of enabling goods and services that are critical for individual agency and self-determination without which individuals are limited to reap economic returns for their efforts or their ingenuity. Public intervention is needed to guarantee these inclusive economic rights to counterbalance the accrued economic and racialized private and public power in which in isolation economic markets are incapable to redress. Governments need to directly compete with and crowd out inferior private options that don't ensure universal and quality healthcare, housing, schooling, schooling, financial services, access to capital, and free mobility throughout society without the psychological and physical threat of detention or bodily harm at the hands of a state-sanctioned or internationally sanctioned terror because someone's social identity is linked to a vulnerable or stigmatized group. I can go through some policies, but in the interest of having a, a vibrant conversation, I'm going to conclude by saying, in the end, our industrial policy, it needs to promote our economy in a way that centers people in our environment. That is a human rights economy. And these investments need to be made permanent and intentionally inclusive of all racial, ethnic, and social identity groups in their design, in their implementation, and in their management of these policies. Otherwise, we fail in answering those two fundamental questions with which we should always begin. What is the purpose of an economy and what is government's role in achieving that purpose? Thank you. Thank you. Let me bring you back to um, the rest of the Zoom room. Yeah, huge round of applause. I see clapping emojis, hearts, thank you. all of the things. Um, thank you. Really, really appreciate that. That was, yeah, that was powerful. <laughs> really, you. really appreciate that. And I, I love, yeah, you just drawing us back to what is the purpose of the economy. There's so much that I think we can unpack here. And this is really the space for all of you to, to share your thoughts, your comments, your questions. We have about 30 minutes or just less to, to unpack this further. So I'm really handing it over to you. I've seen some things in the Q&A, but we want this to be interactive. So please put up your hand or use the hand um, button at the bottom of your screen. You should be able to find it under reactions to raise hand and we can start the conversation. And, so and so, well, if, if you don't mind, please manage the conversation because I'll, I'll get distracted. Yes, I'm okay. here. Thank you. Okay, good, good. I'm good. here to manage the, the questions as they come Thank in you. and we'll direct them to you. Okay. And also, of course, others um, that have a strong opinion or want to kind of come in and provide a, a solution or answer feel free to do that as well. But I'm on the chat and on the, the hands that come up. Thank you. Great. All right, let's start with Stephen and we'll then go to Phil straight after that. Uh, thank you, Derek, for a brilliant talk. Thank you. Um, I'm an economist at the University of Maryland and have written about many of the subjects you talked about and I'm in very much in agreement with your analysis and your uh, views. I, I have a fairly simple question um, with perhaps an unclear answer. Um, but can a, my question is, can a, a human rights economy exist under capitalism? Uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll say this, I don't think we, we uh, actually practice capitalism or socialism in reality. I think capitalism is the undergrind intellectual framework by which we put forth neoliberalism. 
I think uh, uh, there there are aspects of neoliberalism that aren't capitalism, uh, but it is the underlying ideological justification and explanation for the ways in which government diverts resources in strategic ways towards the firm and powerful elite. Powerful elite. Uh, so, so the the my my response is um, obviously oppression predates capitalism. Um, whether you ideologically stand closer towards a command economy or market economy, sorry, y'all, I, I forgot to turn off my phone, terrible, uh, a, a market economy or command economy, at a baseline, you need economic rights. I guess I'm arguing that before you even answer that question, start with economic rights and then how you want to operate your economy more towards market base or more towards uh, command economy uh, becomes somewhat of a political outcome of some decision making in my ideal. I have views, I have values of where I would stand, but I guess what I'm arguing is that it, it, regardless of that, economic rights has to be a fundamental baseline. Agreed. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, simple, but <laughs> straight to the point there. Thanks, really appreciate that question. Let's go to Phil. Oh, thanks ever so much. That was a great uh, piece. Now, I've learned so much already. The um, I'll just have one comment and then a question. I mean, the comment is just to say, <clears throat> I think the human rights movement also needs to hold up its hands and say over the last 40 years with the domination of neoliberal ideology we've essentially so much of our movement of the human rights movement has colluded in that by emphasizing civil and political rights in an a, a, fundamental as they are but in a in a way that unbalances the importance of economic social and cultural rights at the same time i think we're in a moment of an overton window where you know these issues of economics and economic rights are coming more to the fore precisely because you know, human rights and democracy are losing their grip in terms of public support and people are moving to authoritarian populism and that's scaring a lot of the centre-left and the centre-right such that they start to believe precisely what you said at the beginning, which is what is the role of the government in creating a, an economy of shared prosperity? So that's my comment. The question is just uh, to say, you know, you spoke quite a lot about industrial policy um, I would I'd like to hear a bit more about the regulatory side of that, particularly with liability, because I think regulation drives board attention in terms of companies. But I'd also just add that, you know, our global economies are dominated by global value chains where 90 percent of the workforce of transnational corporations are actually in those global value chains out in, you know, Bangladesh and uh, Kenya and um, Myanmar, etc., where the hyper hyper exploitation can occur, and where there is impunity for that abuse. So, I'd just like to ask you what you're seeing in terms of applying those principles that you brought into those global value chains of the of the economy. Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, and I completely agree with your comments in the beginning. I, I even used the word co-optation. It, yeah. It's strategic that they use the words freedom. <laughs> And they emphasize certain rights at the exclusion of others. It's almost brilliant with, they, with the, the co-optation. Not it almost is. It is brilliant, sadly. Um, in the Overton moment, uh, another very astute comment. Uh, we we have a window, but we also have vulnerability. Yeah. Uh, what comes next in this Overton is a is a dire question that we need to actively be working to 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 answer. Um, Industrial policy, you know, tax policy is probably the biggest fiscal tool we have and both domestically and internationally as it relates to, and, and I'm thinking of tariffs, I'm thinking of, of uh, I'm, I'm, I guess perhaps linking regulation, I shouldn't, in taxes, but <clears throat> departments of treasury are always actively involved in industrial policy. One of the things that the neoliberal movement has has done is uh, ghost a tax cut is non-activist government, but choosing who 
whom we collect revenue from and whom we don't is industrial policy. There's a book coming out by Mercer Baradaran. I'm forgetting the name of it, but it'll be her new book, which is basically has the thesis examining the activist role of neoliberalism, although it's purported as being non-activist. So, so I'm, I'm not being coherent. Let me make the point. Uh, my point is that we're always engaged in industrial policy, whether we call it that or not. Um, and governments need to be thinking about using that industrial policy in a way that it's strategically directing resources towards people and place. And then as it relates to the international question, governments have a fiduciary with regards to um, in international investments as well. Uh, and I think an example in history, a positive example, was the Marshall Plan, that its its purpose was to uh, redevelop Europe after the destructions of World War II with the goal of building infrastructure, not only to promote economic activity, as we traditionally define it, but tranquility to avoid World War III. The problem with the Marshall Plan is that it was myopic and only going towards Europe and mostly Western Europe. There was no intent to redevelop other parts of the world. There was no intent to invest in the infrastructure of other parts of the world. So I don't know if that's a direct answer to your question, but my idea of industrial policy does not limit itself to domestic borders, but for foreign policy, for mobility, mo mobility reasons, for environmental reasons, those with resources like the United States need to pursue. You know, it, it's great that in the first time in our history, a secretary of treasurer used the word global tax on capital. Now, we haven't brought it to fruition, but if we're talking about an over 10, uh, we need a global tax on capital, and we can use those resources in a way that promotes development in a more egalitarian investment way uh, to promote human flourishing. I was muted. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to keep it going because there are many uh, hands up here. I think we're going to have to keep it at Caroline um, as the last uh, question. So, oh, okay. um, <laughs> do you want me to hear gonna... three and then try to answer three? Yeah, or... let's okay. let's maybe give it to two. I, I think okay, Jen, yeah. from what I saw, had a quite a few questions. So, Jen, if you can maybe summarize to just your top two. <laughs> I saw you had uh, four different things in the chat. So you can go ahead and then we'll go to Alison. Okay, let me focus just on the main one. Thank you for this great talk and inspiration. I'm no expert in the League of Nations, but I was watching a video recently about it. And I noticed that because they didn't start with a common base of common principles, it was really a power struggle duking it out over, you know, who gets what restitution. And because Michael Lerner's research tells us uh, that we have this inherent drive for justice, except when our place in the order of deserving, or in other words, the economy, is threatened, we redefine the world to exclude the injustice and I say, gee, that's too bad, but it has nothing to do with me. So therefore, I'm wanting to know your opinion about the role of common principles, maybe from all religions or wherever we get them, such as the oneness of humanity, equality of all, the abolition of prejudice, and so on, in bringing us together, giving us that common foundation where a human rights economy and hopefully an all-life economy can be negotiated. Great question. Great. Thanks for that summary, Jen. Really appreciate it. Alison, if you can share your question. Um, I'm wondering um, how, how a focus on policy can be extended beyond you know, the industrial policy um, that Derek was speaking about. Um, I'm speaking as a psychologist, and I'm concerned that 
uh, models of mental illness that are deployed um, across the industrialized world, especially, are really driven by quite redundant models. Even the World Health Organization in 2017 was advising against this biomedical model and putting in place a more humanistic based um, models of psychology. And what bothers me is that um, people become excluded from um, their capacity to uh, be integrated into the economic functioning, you know, by diag mental health diagnoses that exclude them, you know, even the, mo the most moderate diagnoses of um, uh, uh, anxiety or, or depression. And then they become um, uh, income for the giant pharmaceutical industry, which um, does nothing to benefit them. Um, a paper that I gave at a conference last year just showed that the numbers are growing um, um, year on year, both of people um, who are seeking um, treatment for these most commonly diagnosed in illnesses and people who are being prescribed drugs and what's being done at the moment is evidentially not effective so i think there's an important responsibility um to link um economic policy with health policy um and i'm wondering if you, you can suggest how we might achieve that thank you thank you okay so i'll yeah. go ahead and okay so uh again all these questions are are fantastic thank you um i agree you got to begin with values and uh Again, what modern day economics has done in a remarkably, uh, perhaps disingenuous way, is purport itself to be a science devoid of values, devoid of being of politics. There's an underlying value in our neoliberal economy, self-interested accumulation without bounds. That is an underlying value. And we could talk about the welfare theorems of economics, and we're working on a paper uh, to point out that the welfare theorems of economics, and we can critique them, uh, but that one of the big problems itself is that it's presented as science and not normative. So uh, we need to begin with values and we need to collectively define that value, those values. And part of our human existence is a vulnerability to relative status where uh, we define our worth in not only our absolute position, but where we fit relative to others and groups, tribalism becomes a mechanism by which uh, that can be weaponized in such a way that some elite interests can accumulate both economic and political power ad infinitum by finding some dominant political group and offer them, them relative economic status compared to another. So that is a challenge that we're up against. But there are many values that define our human existence. Uh, solidarity is one of them. Uh, the need, the, the desire to contribute productively in social groups. We all want to create things. We all want to have agency to do things. Those are values as well. Um, tranquility is a value. So how do we come up with the norms and the policies and the North Star uh, to create and define that society that wins, that, that gets to define the values and uh, creates the issues where we're putting forth the issues to achieve the values in non-competitive ways? Far too often on the left, we find the issue we want and in a zero sum context, we fight for that issue at the expense of others, or we're willing to compromise at the expense of others. So we will sacrifice black people in the interest of class solidarity with great compromises uh, in, the, in the notion of interest convergence, not values, but interest convergence. Well, when that interest doesn't converge, guess who's quick to get sold out? Uh, because we didn't have underlying values in the first place by which we were unwilling to compromise. So so that I think that's the answer to the to the first question. Uh, the second question. Psychologists get to define the economy. Economics should not be the exclusive domain of economists. Clergy gets to define the econ the economy. We get to define the values by which we determine what, how, and to whom. We get to define what we value. 
do we value mental health? Do we value, you know, we can keep going, self-determination, et cetera. We get to define that. Um, I center on industrial policy in this talk and others for strategic reasons, because I'm trying to be tongue in cheek and point out that we're always engaged in industrial policy. We, the government always is tilting the scale in favor of someone versus the other. There's never a scenario where government is not activist. There's no such thing as a farmer's market without somebody having a permit. So I'm trying to promote a more honest discourse uh, in, in, in trying to so that we actually can have pathway to a North Star and challenge the existing structures in which we live. Thank you. I am going to quickly hand it over to Mike. Um, and then we'll go to Eddie and then Caroline. We'll see our mouth <laughs> this time for you. Um, but let's go with Mike um, and Eddie and Caroline. I thought that was my mic drop. I got more questions. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> you got more. We have 10 minutes. So let's go, Mike, Eddie and Caroline. Let's um, hear from you three and then hear from um, Derek and then Amal. I'm not sure if we're going to get to you, but we'll try. Can you hear me all right? Yes, go yeah. ahead. Just to ask, why have so many politicians and economists ignored the warning made by Professor Simon Kuznets about GDP growth uh, back in 1934? Thanks, Eddie. <laughs> Oh, should I answer now or do? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Let's let's take three okay. and then we'll we'll come back. Oh uh, yeah, I I wanted to um, and I'm I'm still trying to frame my question, but it's it's really about the ideas of who gets to participate in the ideation of what this economy looks like, because a lot of times this conversation feels very inaccessible for folks who don't have a certain amount of pedigree, a certain amount of time a certain amount of kind of support or even um, uh, the, the stature in life to show up to this conversation and imagine that they deserve a certain level of freedom, a certain level of um, access to certain resources. And those folks are not normally in conversations like this to get the information, to find out how to participate and how to engage. And how, how do we create, when we're talking about policy and how, when we're talking about engagement, how do we bring those folks to the to tables like this or to tables where they can get whatever whatever access they need in order to figure out how to engage. Because I don't necessarily know that having the folks who are gonna be using the language of the current systems are going to take in mind what it is to do this from a different status of life. And I, I find in the work that I'm trying to do, it's hard to figure out how to bridge that gap um, for folks who are just everyday people who are just trying to figure out how to pay their bills that aren't thinking big picture economy change. They're thinking right now, how do I get, how do I feed my children and take them to Disney World at the same time? You know, um, and so that's, again, I, again I, don't, I don't know if I phrased that question the best, but I'm trying to pull it together. 100%, but yeah. we feel you, Eddie. Thank you so much for bringing that. And just wanna say like the rest of my team here and myself, this is part of the work that we do. We are immersed in various spaces. So we'd love to connect further after this as well. <laughs> Uh, Caroline. Yeah, thanks. And thanks, yeah, Eddie and Mike, both for your questions as well. I wish we had longer. I wish we, you know, we could go to for a beer afterwards and continue the conversation. Um, my questions are actually, first of all, I want to say thanks for this talk. It's great to hear from Derek. I, I love your idea of the baby bonds. And, and Derek also, I love that thing you've got in your background behind you. I wish we, I was in a classroom with you and you could talk us through that as well, but I know our time is limited. So let me focus. The question I wanted to have is about, I've done work um, from a human rights perspective on economic issues. And I've just put a little plug. Uh oh, I think I've lost you. We lost, we lost. you. We lost we, your story. So yeah, just a plug for, for human rights economics. So one of the sort of advocacy sort of things that I identified in that work is really working on GDP, that that's maybe where human rights advocates can be the most useful in, in joining forces with people who are arguing for alternatives to GDP. I think there's a clear entry point there. But my question to you, Derek, is you know, working with human rights organizations a lot, this 
people who are not economists, and I think this maybe goes a little bit to Eddie's point as well, people who are not economists are so vulnerable to co-optation or you know and and so you know for instance i work now i work more on, on women's rights and feminist economics and i'm in touch a lot with um the um, uh, women's rights committee you know the who supervises implementation of the women's rights convention and they're really keen to you know to challenge states on you know what are you doing for you know women's economics rights but you know i go there when i can when i have time and i try to explain to them you know some of the or i try to point you know, key questions but then, you know, all the sort of the World Bank and the, you know, even, even you know, all those sort of other people come in and say, oh, you know, women's economic empowerment and integrate women into, you know, international, you know, value chains. And, you know, they can earn a little bit more for each kilo of chocolate they, they you know, they sell to the these big companies. And and this is all sort of doing so much good for women. And, and it just, you know, I sort of think, you know, what would you suggest to the human rights community to be able to work on economic issues and engage in debate, but without being co-opted, you know, in such a, you know, and contributing, you know, becoming an, another actor in this chain of sort of, you know, extractive neo-colonial um, um, economic relationships? Thank you. I think you um, can go ahead, Derek, yeah. Let's try okay. with those three first. Um, oh, the the Simon Kuznets. Uh, political reasons. Again, I guess I led with the point that economics itself is not immune to the politics and power of our time. Uh, we can look and see where funding goes. We can look and see uh, where certain strategic interests are directed towards the academy. Um, that that is purposeful and uh, about power. So um, the part about this being inaccessible to a broader audience. Again, I think that economics has pulled the wool over society's eyes by purporting itself to be a science. So there's intentionality in not making it accessible. There's intentionality and in, uh, you know. Uh, the discourse that you don't understand or the discourse that this is just the way it is. There's a naturalization of inequality and poverty. That This is the result of who's deserving and undeserving. This is the natural outcome of, 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 of merit, of ingenuity, of effort. That's a dogma that we just accept, that we don't challenge. Um, and that is just again just a dogma. So that that's the problem. The problem is uh, we need to demystify economics. We need to, uh, uh, yeah, just that demystify economics. Um, what else do I want to say? Um, the last question. I also want to point out that this is the work of <clears throat> a graphic artist, Sam Scipio, who's magnificent. We had a convening and kind of like this. And matter of fact, I'm going to ask Sam to start coming whenever I give a talk like this. She captures the conversation in art. And this is this is part of her work. And she's brilliant. So we definitely going to uh, ask her to come whenever I do something like this. Uh, so we need uh, co-optation, the vulnerability of co-optation. One one co-optation I'm I've been trying to make the point for is that human rights is absent of economic rights. If we don't have all five elements of human rights all the time, then they're inadequate, incomplete, and often in some cases even counterproductive. Again, they allow they allow us to hide under a guise of you're free because you get the vote. You're free because you can civilly protest. Um, likewise, if we had everyone that was housed and with food, that would also be an incomplete notion of freedom and justice without the capacity to have political civic engagement. So really, I think there's the blueprint was set. The blueprint was set when you include all five elements of those human rights and any absence of them is a co-optation. And then here's the other point I'd like to make. Um, where that original document could have improved 
is if it had language of affirmative inclusion, if it had language to recognize that politics and economics is never separate from identity group stratification, that identity, identity group stratification in terms of who we think is worthy and unworthy is always in the equation. As such, one has to have affirmative inclusion. And then even if we think about history, the ways in which resources and power has come to be distributed, if we ever expect to redress that history, another reason why we have to be intentionally anti-sexist, anti-racist, to redress the current structures that will default to exclusion. You know, I didn't get a lot of time to talk about, about reparations, but in the end, reparations is part of human rights. That truth and reconciliation allows us to understand history in a way, not only for dignity and respect for those that have been harmed, but prospectively, when we think about policy, it grounds inequality in what it actually is grounded in, which is resource deprivation. So I, I think ultimately we also are going to need some reparations um, in, in many forms in order to get to this North Star that I'm describing. Thank you. 100% agree. And this topic is huge. <laughs> there's so much that you can unpack. I mean, there's only so much you can unpack in an hour. Um, I really appreciate the comments, the questions that are in the chat. It's helpful for us to kind of get a sense of the types of questions that are being asked. So even if it wasn't answered specifically now, it's 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 stuff for us to think about as Wellbeing Economy Alliance. And we'd love to obviously come back to you with some talks maybe on those topics specifically or broaden out this topic a little bit more. So we are a co-creative community. And this is what it's all about, is the connecting and amplifying the work that is also already being done here. Like Caroline, for example, is doing such an incredible work in this space too. So please do connect on the chat, I always say the chat is where it's at. <laughs> Connect, share email addresses, share links to your work, um, because the only way we can do this um, and overcome is doing it together. So I really want to emphasize that and invite you to join our sessions going forward. Um, I've put my email address on the chat. I've put our website link in terms of joining the Wellbeing Economy Alliance so you can become part of this network and be part of thinking through these topics together. But to, yes, I wanted to <laughs> go ahead, Derek. I'm sorry. I, 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 I don't want to lose the chance of saying one last thing before we go. One is gratitude yes. to you. This was marvelously uh, uh, put together and moderated. And then the other point is uh, we all, uh, for creating this movement, for creating this table, because uh, that, you know, that is the answer. The answer is a movement. The answer is a social movement where we become the conventional wisdom, where we change it to what, what it is that we're talking about. And that requires common values. It requires that we don't compete with each other, but cooperate. There's so much in this world for us to compete with each other over, we got the most brilliant ideas, we got the best policy. So we need structures in which we're, we're working in cooperation. And then the last part is fellowship. That builds trust, uh, that builds community, and we need to have a good time doing this work. Otherwise, it'll depress us to hell. So. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. Oh, thank you so, so much. And like a huge, huge thank you to you, Derek, because we know that your time is precious and you still have a full day ahead of you. So really a huge, yeah, big ups to you. This presentation was really rich and like so interesting. People are asking for the transcript. So please share <laughs> information that you do have on the chat, but also you can email me and we'll be emailing everybody the recording and some of the links that were shared here. But I'm sorry to have gone a little bit over time. This conversation doesn't stop now. We keep it going. So please get involved. We'd love to chat further. Thank you so much, everybody. A big wave to you all and lots of love. Bye. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Merci. Thanks very much.